Yes. Uh, to be frank, uh, military reform uh, was very challenging at that time. Uh, not easy, uh, but uh, we have to do it. Now, firstly, we have to define uh, the ultimate objective. What are the goals and why the military reforms should be conducted? And I remember when leading uh, a team to draw the blueprint and roadmap of the military reform, I set clear objectives. Number one, the military must stop playing politics, practical politics. Number two, the military must respect democracy, support democracy. So with that, uh, we uh, had to win the so-called internal acceptance and internal support. So I talked to all generals, Army, Navy, Air Force, that uh, we have to change. Uh, what kind of change I explained the objectives, the uh, step to be taken, the roadmap, and also the blueprint. And uh, I was so happy because 70% of the, uh, the generals and high-ranking officers support the idea of reforms. Next, I have to talk to the reformists, the civil society. Please give us a time to change to prepare our change because uh, the reform must be having clear objectives, must be well managed, uh, and the agenda uh, must also be clear. And after uh, around uh, one year time, uh, by very intensive works, day and night, so finally we did our reforms and um, later on when I left my military uh, uh, career I entered the politics and uh, became president of Indonesia my task is to safeguard to ensure that the military reform will go ahead and um, uh, reach the overall objective that we had that we have set up before. So the story of our reform and with that, the military, the military is not only supporting the national reform, but we were part of the reform. We were part of the solution. And even we uh, could say to the uh, elements of old regime, look, we have reform ourselves. We could do it. Why don't we work together to reform our country for the better future, more democratic and more people oriented? Yes, yes, Islam actually uh, must be fully understood by uh, friends around the globe because Islam is misled, misunderstood by non-Islam and by Islam uh, itself. So uh, talking about what is the relation between Islam and democracy or it is Islam compatible with democracy. So I have to say that uh, there are Islamic values that in my view are uh, compatible with the, the, the democratic values. For example, Islam by our teaching love of peace, love justice, love uh, consensus building, uh, love uh, uh, prosperity, uh, love equality. And those are actually also uh, democratic values. So we try to convince our uh, Muslim, our Ummah, look, our values are very much similar to democratic values, that's number one. Number two, uh, my friend, uh, in Indonesia, I think uh, more than 40% uh, of our political parties are uh, Islamic-based political parties. It means the idealism, the ideology is Islam. 
but the respect universal values the respect nation state not borderless islamic world uh, their platform uh, also uh, quite relevant to the national agenda the uh, national policy so we could uh, uh, say to the people look our islamic political parties are part of uh, the democracy itself so why don't uh, we uh, uh, do things that not to contradict contradict islams and democracy and of course like um, many other islamic countries there are elements of hardliners of uh, radicals uh, and and for that and I, I have to say they say that well Islam is not compatible with democracy but the number is small so it is becoming the duties and the responsibility of the religious leaders of moderate Islamic leaders to uh, talk to their followers to uh, talk to the Ummah that well Islam is compatible with uh, a democracy and with that actually as uh, it is proven uh, by Indonesia uh, now there's no problem at all uh, uh, the, democr uh, the, the democracy can be well applied in our politics in our system so there are many approaches that we could uh, uh, do to ensure that there is a, a good harmony uh, between Islam and, 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 and democracy. And it uh, works in Indonesia. Yes, well, ASEAN uh, now consists of uh, 10 member countries, and ASEAN, to be frank, varies in terms of uh, the ideologies, the system, political system, I mean. Uh, so, uh, we need to accept that reality. Uh, firstly, ASEAN must be able to work together uh, while respecting uh, uh, the diversity among uh, the member countries. But uh, there is a historic moment for ASEAN when we were able to, to renew our charter the ASEAN mm -hmm. Charter, mm -hmm. and then the new charter, and I have involved personally, it, it is now clearly stated that ASEAN uh, respect democracy, respect rule of law, respect human rights. I think it is a, a dramatic uh, a, a, a achievement that we could do by uh, having new charter of ASEAN but of course, remember, uh, among us, the member of ASEAN, some of us are having a communist ideology, uh, centralism, some uh, are exercising authoritarian or semi-authoritarian type government, some uh, uh, one of, of our members of monarchy in, in, in its political systems and some exercising democratic values. So even though we have our charter uh, with, uh, with the respect for democracy, human rights, and rule of law, I think uh, I personally uh, understand that we need transition. Uh, I do believe that someday uh, all countries will fully respect democracy, rule of law, and human rights, and probably they will adopt that kind of values that that is. Uh, the success of uh, how uh, ensuring ASEAN uh, to really accept democratic values.